admit that I actually haven't ridden long in common riding, um, but um, I have done all the others. And I'll be at Lauder in the saddle on Saturday <coughs> after quite a gap. Well, I must say, it's great to come back to a political meeting in Kelso. I don't know how many of you here remember the, the great political meetings at the Roxy Cinema in Kelso in the 1960s and the 1970s. And they would start at half past ten at night because that was um, after the, the cinema had come out. And that was always the, the last Liberal meeting of the campaign. And I think it was probably the last political meeting in the whole of Britain at general elections because we would drive to, um, <coughs> to Kelso after a, two earlier meetings of the, the evening and the radio would be on and the radio would say, that's, well, that's the election campaign over. All the meetings have been held and we would say, no, they haven't. There's still one to come in Kelso. <laughs> um, well, those were great days. Um, but I want to start off by saying what some of the things that I see the referendum as not being about. And one of the things that we, some of us have had to do is to put long to our, to our own party policy on one side to look at the question on its merits. Now, it's over 50 years since I joined the Liberal Party. And I did so then because it was the only UK party with a policy for Scottish Home Rule. And although I was really preferred the, perhaps preferred the idea of independence then, it seemed to me at that time that the principle of federalism seemed both viable and achievable. And there's no doubt that the re-establishment of the Scottish Parliament in 1999 was a heady time for all of us. And it was a great occasion. But I think that now that it's been established, we have to look at what the results have been. And I think what Carol says about the whole, oh, sorry, what Ash uh, said about the whole um, question of, of how little power it has, particularly over taxation, is a very pertinent one. But you know, in spite of the um, establishment of the Scottish Parliament, I find that the misunderstanding about Scotland in the southern part of our shared island continues. And every go time I go down south, I'm made more and more aware of this. The Westminster village simply cannot get their collective head round us. <coughs> We are an anomaly to which there are many deeper unanswerables than the West Lothian question. And given this, I can no longer believe that it is possible to achieve federalism in a nation state where one constituent part is so much larger than the others. At the time of the union of the parliaments, the population of England to Scotland was about three to one, and it gave the opportunity of a reasonably equal partnership. But there has a, been a bleeding, particularly of the young and the ablest of our population, not just overseas, but southwards, because the opportunities to operate at the highest level have not been there in Scotland any longer. And now the population ratio is nine to one, and the lemming-like rush to the overcrowded wen of the southeast has made the body politic of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland both toxic and outdated. And there is indeed something rotten in the state of the UK. It's time for a radical change, and there's only one option for that on the ballot paper. So I have no hesitation in breaking ranks with my party on this. I am still and will continue to be a Liberal. A yes vote will not bring immediate independence, and we will still be sending MPs to Westminster next year. And at that time, I will be playing my part again in the re-election of Michael Moore. Secondly, the referendum is most definitely not about the popularity or otherwise of individual political leaders. How we vote on the 18th of September transcends current personalities. Nor with respect to John Swinney, should we be guided by what, whether we personally will be better or worse off, worse off economically in the short term. This can only be guesswork at best and misinformation at worst. 
After all, we are all governed by the immortal words of Harold Macmillan, who, when asked what the most important influence in shaping politics was, replied, events, dear boy, events. <laughs> the decision is not about short-term gain. It is about the kind of future we can envisage for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. But before looking at the future, I would argue that we need to understand the past, what has made me what what has made us what we are, and what has given us a different agenda. Now, some of this may be very elementary, but it's worth repeating. First, Great Britain is the largest of a group of islands first documented by the Romans. <coughs> the great refers to its size amongst that group of islands, and not to any glorious deeds of the Victorians. It is therefore, first and foremost, a geographical entity, we can, if we so choose, go on calling ourselves British in the same way that our neighbours, the Danes and Norwegians, are Scandinavian, the Peruvians and Chileans are South Americans, and the Spanish and Portuguese are Iberians. Personally, I can't wait to be able to fill in my nationality as Scottish and have a Scottish passport. But I have a nephew who, far, who is a Christmas tree farmer, and he had a unfortunate incident recently when one of the, his big clients in the South said, oh, if Scotland votes yes, we won't be able to market your trees because we can't say grown in Britain. And I said to you, oh, don't be silly, they're still grown in the British Isles, still say they're grown in Britain. But what does independence mean? And the late great Joe Grimmond <coughs> wants to find independence as a seat at the United Nations for Scotland between Saudi Arabia and Senegal. And if you look up, that was a long time ago, but if you look up it up, it will still be between Saudi Arabia and Senegal. They may not be terribly um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> polite. <laughs> they may not be the neighbours we would choose, uh, but we would be there as equals amongst them. But after a yes vote, the phrase R-U-K makes no sense, whatever. The rest of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, what a muddled mouthful. <laughs> it shows, doesn't it, how little the no supporters have actually faced the possibility of a yes vote, a subject I shall come back to. What will remain will be the Kingdom of England, the Principality of Wales, and the Province of Ulster. And that will be something to be as proud of as the reclaimed nation state of Scotland. And I think anybody listening to the um, Commonwealth Games recently gets a, um, a lot of pleasure in hearing Jerusalem played for the English and Land of My Fathers played for the Welsh. And I have to say, they have much better uh, national anthems than we have. <laughs> <laughs> so much for the geography lesson. Now let me move on to history. It's claimed by the No campaign that Scotland only became preeminent in many fields because of the Act of Union. Now this ignores the achievements of such scientists as John Napier of Merkiston, who invented logarithms and calculus. It ignores the scholars and poets who flourished from James IV's Renaissance court onwards. But more than that, it ignores the foundations on which the later achievements were built our education system, our church tradition, and our legal system. These triple pillars were protected in the Act of Union, and they single out Scotland's case as unique amongst the lost nations seeking sovereignty from a larger nation state. They are all, all also areas which are the foundations of that democratic and internationalist tradition which we boast of, quite rightly. It is they, rather than the socialism of the 20th century, that gives us that distinctiveness. First, education. At the end of the 15th century, the Scottish Parliament, which sat as one body and not di didn't divide between lords and clergy on the one hand and commons on the other, the three estates met together as a unicameral chamber. The Scottish Parliament passed the first Education Act in Europe, by the end of the 16th century, there were four universities in Scotland to England's two, and John Knox's vision of a school in every parish was well underway. We were the first to have free primary school education, 
and University Education in Scotland was always open to the latter parents as well as the laird's son. The second pillar of our nationhood is, or at any rate, was the Church of Scotland. In England, the Reformation came about at the whim of Henry VIII. He basically swapped the Pope's headship of the Church with his own. The Church of England remains a top-down structure, with appointments of archbishops made by the King and later the government. In Scotland, the Reformation was a grassroots movement. It actually overthrew the existing government, that of the Regent Mary of Guise. Like the Lutheran churches on the continent, its governance gives power first to the local Kirk sessions and then upwards to the Presbytery and the General Assembly of the Church. Finally, our legal system, which was in place by the 17th century, is based on the pan-European basis of Roman law, the result of the common practice of budding Scots lawyers to further their education in France, Italy, and the Netherlands. And I must say that within the last century, there has been an additional uh, area which I think has kept our heads high as a nation, and that, even if we're not very good at some of them, are the sports fixtures. <laughs> but these foundations have made us what we are. I'm not advocating a return to the past. What I'm saying is that the past shapes what we are today. Our traditions in church, law, and above all education are what give us a different outlook. They are part of why we should seize this opportunity to create a new order for the islands that the Romans call Britannia, a new constitution that will ultimately benefit all of it. I do not for one moment think that in the short term the setting up of a recovered Scotland will be easy, simple or quick. We will rely on the goodwill and national sense of purpose of those leading the no campaign to put differences behind them, to accept a yes result and to work in a common purpose on behalf of Scotland and not of the larger nation state whose time has run its course. At the moment, I don't think they are facing such a possibility. And I have to say that I find that the smugness amongst many of the no leaders is extremely distasteful. But I urge them all to declare that they will give their loyalty to a yes voting Scotland if that is the result on the 18th of September. Now, I have to say that um, I am not one who does social media. Twitter and Facebook pass me by. I can just about manage texts, but I'm not very good even with the mobile phone. But this campaign has reminded me a little of the heady days of the by-election of nearly 50 years ago. In that, there were packed meetings and badges and car stickers and above all, enthusiasm. On a snowy polling day, 85% of the borders turned out to vote. And I hope and believe that this will happen again and that there will be a high vote on September the 18th throughout the whole of Scotland and that vote would be for a new Scotland, an independent Scotland. I urge you to vote yes then.